Miller's classification of marginal tissue recession was published in 1985. Over those years, there have been some subtle changes that I would like to share with you from a retrospective standpoint. Let's have a little evolution and history lesson. 35 years ago, the emphasis was on functional. 35 years ago, the emphasis was on a functional result, not so much an aesthetic result. Surgical techniques were referred to as mucogingival surgery, which evolved into periodontal plastic surgery. Mucogingival surgery produces a functional result, whereas periodontal plastic surgery produces both a functional and an aesthetic result. Mucogingival surgery classically is defined by Friedman in the Texas Dental Journal in 1957. And this referred to several different things. First, it was surgery to deepen the vestibule. Second, it was to address an aberrant frenum. And third, to create keratinized tissue. In the 1950s, Keratinized tissue was actually scar tissue, which formed when we did the denudation or pushback procedure, which exposed vast areas of bone where cells from the periodontal ligament space migrated over the bone, creating scar tissue that functioned as keratinized tissue. Let's go back to the first topic, surgery to deepen the vestibule. In the 1950s, the uh, home care procedures, it was felt that you couldn't properly place the toothbrush in the mandibular anterior area in a shallow vestibule. So that gave privy to deepening the vestibule simply to place the toothbrush properly. Obviously, we know that that is not the way that, it, that we need to do this. Second, address the aberrant frontal. Until Broadbent presented an article in the 1940s which showed that there was a four millimeter, uh, mucogingival surgery has been done for many, many years, but the term was not defined until the 1950s, 1957 to begin to, to be specific by Dr. Nate Friedman when he published this in the Texas Dental Journal. Now remember, in the 1950s, the focus was on function and not aesthetics. And so the three things that he talked about doing were surgery to deepen the vestibule, to address an aberrant frontum, and third, to create keratinized tissue. So let's go to the first topic, surgery to deepen the vestibule. The perception in the 1950s was that you could not place the toothbrush properly to angle it to clean when you had a shallow vestibule. So that allowed a uh, dentist to go in there and deepen the vestibule. Certainly we know now that that is not necessary. The second was to address an aberrant frontum. Prior to the early 1940s, before Broadbent presented his article, it was felt that the, uh, that the diastema between the front teeth was caused by the frontum. And it was common practice in the delivery room to quote, clip the frontal. But what Broadbent found was that 96% of children as the central incisors, maxillary central incisors erupted, had a, a diastema. However, if that will close 96% uh, of the time once the premolars are in place. So after finding that out, there was less frontal surgery done creating keratinized tissue. You will note that that is in quotation marks. In the 1950s, the denization or pushback procedure was in vogue. And we say keratinized tissue, this is actually scar tissue. For in doing this, vast areas of mucosa was removed, leaving bone exposed to granulate over with a tissue that was a scar tissue that focused, that functioned like uh, keratinized tissue. This was a painful, slow healing process, and bone was lost as this occurred. But as you would expect, you got zero pocket depth, and the scar tissue did function as keratinized tissue. So we fast forward till the 1980s, 
in the definition of periodontal plastic surgery I presented in the dental clinics of North America. And this is surgery to correct anatomical, developmental, or traumatic deformities of the gingiva and the alveolar mucosa. A more comprehensive term and more descriptive of what we are doing in the 21st century. A classification of marginal tissue recession. Why did I use the word marginal tissue rather than gingival recession? One of my mentors was Dr. John Pritchard, who was a stippler for um, proper nomenclature. And he asked me, he says, PD, when you have recession, do you know whether you had alveolar mu mucosal recession or did you have gingival recession if you don't have a history? So paying attention to what Dr. Pritchard said, I used the term marginal tissue recession, which I think is a more appropriate term. So this article was published in 1985, and now we are in 2017, some 30 plus years later. And as I said earlier, some subtle changes have taken place not only based on more and better understanding, but also on the technology uh, and the way that products have been developed. The original def definition said marginal tissue recession, which does not extend to the mucogingival junction, and there is no bone or soft tissue loss in the internal area. And this is correct. But I think a more accurate term is there is a attached gingiva on the facial. For you may have a probing depth that goes beyond the mucogingival junction with keratinized tissue on the facial, but it is not attached, and that is not a class 1 recession, that is a class 2 recession, as I will explain to you in a minute. Class 2 recession, marginal tissue recession that extends to or beyond the mucogingival junction. Again, there is no bone or soft tissue loss in the internal area. And as we well know, the predictability of 100% root coverage in a class one and class two is in well into the 90s and a very predictable procedure. So here we see diagrammatically on the left, the article that was in the International Journal and a picture taken from that uh, showing that there is no keratinized tissue on the facial. Now, here is where the difference comes in. So pay attention to this. As we look at this, is the gingiva on the facial attached or unattached? Is this a class one or is this a class two recession? Well, at this point, just looking at it based on our understanding in 1985, this would be classified as a class one recession. However, once we probe the area, we can see that the probe goes beyond the mucogingival junction and so therefore, this is a class two recession, even, there, even though there is keratinized tissue on the facial. The key is it attached or unattached. Why is that significant? If we have attached gingiva, we have a barrier and we have a healthy situation. However, if we do not have that barrier and the gingiva is unattached, then we have a potential problem. So, Class I recessions are grafted mainly because of sensitivity uh, and aesthetics, and certainly that is done with a class II, but also there is a functional component or a disease component, and so class II recessions should be grafted and class I recessions may be grafted. Class three, there's been a change here. There is bone or soft tissue loss in the interdental area or the tooth is extruded as we see on the right. And when the tooth extrudes, it takes the cemental enamel junction and there is no way to get complete root coverage because we can only get root coverage to the height of the gingiva on the facial of the adjacent teeth. The key here, the thing we need to understand, there is interdental recession. So let's look at that closely. Here we see an article, this is from the original article, and we talk about a type C papilla, and we will talk about that in another presentation on what is the indication for the coronal position flap. And you will note here that we do have interdental recession. And what I did in practice, I would actually take a pencil and mark the cemental enamel junction, then I would mark on the facial of the tooth to be grafted where we could get root coverage too, 
so the patient would have a visual idea when I took a picture on that, what the expectation was. So the key in a class three recession is there is interdental recession. But here's where the difference is. Remember in 1985, we were still functionally oriented. And certainly what we see here is a disease process. But I've been asked many times, is there, can there be any keratinized tissue attached or unattached on the facial of a class three? And the answer is yes. So you will find in practice that a significant number of class three recessions that you treat will have attached gingiva on the facial and you can get a partial root coverage on those cases, although you cannot get complete root coverage. Here we see a class three recession, a close up of just what we showed you before. Interdental recession. Type C papilla. And we will discuss the difference between an A papilla, a B papilla, and a C papilla in a later presentation. Class three recession. This case came from Dr. Pat Allen. And if you'll look here, this is the uh, cemento enamel junction. And you will notice that there is interdental recession. So with the advent of the, uh, uh, and with the advent of the tunnel technique, which was presented by Dr. Andrew Allen in the 1990s, we can coronally position this tissue and actually on some early class three, such as this is, we can get 100% recession. We can get a 100% root coverage. This is a case presented uh, that was given to me by Dr. Pat Allen. And you will notice that uh, we have a black line drawn showing the uh, cement, uh, not the cemento enamel junction. Yeah, this is a case given to me by Dr. Pat Allen showing the black line, the cemento enamel junction. We can see the abundance of keratinized tissue, but we can see where the yellow arrows are, we have slight uh, interdental recession. Prior to the presentation by Dr. Andrew Allen of the tunnel technique in the 1990s, we could not get complete root coverage on that. However, uh, an early class three like this, using Allen's tunneling technique and placing grafting material underneath this, we can coronally position this, and for the first time, we're able to get complete root coverage in some early slight class three recessions. An example of what has been developed over the years allowing different surgical procedures which are now available to enhance our result. But what about the need for keratinized tissue? How much height, how much thickness, is it attached or unattached? And we've emphasized the importance of attached. Let's go back to the 1970s. Here's an article published by Lang, and he recommended that two millimeters of keratinized gingiva, one millimeter of attached gingiva is adequate to maintain gingival health. I don't disagree with Dr. Lang, but I think this is age appropriate. But to take a 20 year old who's gonna now in this day and age live to be 90 or 100 with only one millimeter of attached gingiva and only two millimeters of keratinized tissue even with a, a minimal amount of toothbrush abrasion, the likelihood of maintaining that in gingival health for many, many years is very questionable. My good friends, uh, uh, Gary Maynard and Dick Wilson in the 1970s, about the same time that other article was published, said when subcrestal margins are anticipated, five millimeters of keratinized gingiva with three millimeters of attached gingiva was their recommendation. And actually, I think this is more accurate, especially the part that you would like to have three millimeters of keratinized tissue. So vertically, the criteria for a coronal position flap is you need to have three millimeters of keratinized tissue. But how thick should it be? Until Baldy published this article in uh, 1999, we always said, well, it need to be thick enough. And this was just a clinical opinion on that. 
but Baldy presented what I think is a classic article. Now what he did, he took 19 cases and he coronally positioned the existing keratinized tissue. And with a little caliper used to uh, measure the thickness of a crown when you're doing an occlusal adjustment, he found the successful cases needed to have a minimum of eight tenths of a millimeter thickness. Well, that's a scientific number, but look at it from a practical standpoint. We're gonna say that it needs to be a millimeter thick. So the criteria that I recommend, you need three millimeters of vertical keratinized tissue and it needs to be a, uh, one millimeter thick if you're gonna successfully coronally position it. Now, let's go to part two. The research that I used, or the thing that was present in the 1980s, the only surgical procedure for grafting that we had at that time was the free gingival graft. And this is where it all began. Here we see a case that I did many, many years ago, and you will notice that I used three papilla on this. Even if I did not have recession on an adjacent tooth, I always grafted that not only to balance the graft across the facial, but also to give me three papilla to suture to to help stabilize the graft. And you can see here that we have three millimeters, the butt joint margin that we talked about, three millimeters of, of across the central incisors. So if we add three, three for the avascular, three, three for the avascular, three for the avascular, then the width of the graft is going to be 15 millimeters. And I always came three millimeters down below the area of recession. So this graft would be 15 by 18, or the total graft surface would be 12 square millimeters. Here is our avascular area, three by five, three by three, and that's 24, 25 uh, millimeters, square millimeters of avascular surface. And this is where perhaps the graft should be done. But let's look at something else. Here's what we saw before. Same amount of avascular surface. That was where we were grafting originally, but look what I did here. Now, keep in mind that when we were doing this, this was an unpredictable procedure. I didn't know what was gonna result. So what I did, I always came down significantly into the vestibule to have more grafting material so that if I did not get root coverage, I would have an, an adequate barrier zone of keratinized tissue, three millimeters. But look what that did. This area down here, we have an additional uh, three millimeters vertically and 15 millimeters. So we have 45 more millimeters of vascular tissue. And this means that the ratio between vascular and avascular is tilted in our favor. And I think that was one of the reasons perhaps that I was able to get as significant and predictable root coverage that I could with the free gingival graft. I also talked about the butt joint incision and your 15 C blade can be used as a measuring device because you see on the top left, the width of that blade is three millimeters. And you can see on the right where I'm using the point of that to go in and create the butt joint margin. Now, if, if the papilla was narrow there, I would actually go a little apical to that area where the width of the papilla, the bleeding surface, would be three millimeters to give adequate tissue for suturing to and more blood supply to the coronal, coronal surface of the graft. Now on the top left, the question is, do you graft this or do you not? This should be the patient's decision. Are these class ones or are these class two? Certainly they're healthy. And uh, if you wanted to say these are late class ones or early class two, I wouldn't argue with you. But you can see on the lower down here, the difference in the papilla. And on the right, we see a very narrow papilla. That would be a B papilla. The blood supply would not be as good. It would be more difficult to suture to. 
But here we're grafting one, two, three, four teeth. So because we're doing such a large graft, and because we're going to go further apically for the reasons I described earlier, the potential for take is better. Now, Holbrook and Ocean Beam, about the same time that I was publishing this, published their work on root coverage grafting, and there was great emphasis on stabilizing the graft and stretching the vascular channels to get blood supply. So after they published that article, I modified my suturing technique to incorporate the same principles that they were talking about. And so there were three sutures that I used, the interdental positioning suture, the apical stretching suture, and very importantly, the vertical stabilizing suture. Now this is a very old slide. Uh, it's a little bit bleached out, but what I want you to notice here is the size of the graft, how far apically it goes, and because it goes so apically, we are going to necessarily deepen the vestibule. If we look right here, we can see a puncture mark through the graft that goes through the papilla, and that's the interdental positioning suture. And then we come down and we can see the apical stretching suture. But the thing that really makes this work is the vertical stabilizing suture, and very importantly, in the apical area, we need, to, we need to animate that, you will see that we have an area that we can do a serpentine extension of the interdental, of the interdental positioning suture, which greatly stabilizes the graft, prevents shrinkage, and gives us a nice result. So here we see preoperatively, and now we see the day the surgery was done, and here we see about a two-month post-op with a thick graft down there, and look how far it goes into the vestibule, and we can begin to see the formation of a uh, free gingival groove. So this is a very successful case. It's not aesthetic, and certainly, certainly you would not want to do this in the maxillary arch, but still the free gingival graft is a preferred technique by many uh, dentists even to this day. Now, we're going to proceed now to where I think the free gingival graft has a place in modern periodontics. And this is to, gain, to create keratinized tissue around implants. Here's a case where implants have been placed on the, uh, in the canine area. And you will notice that there is no keratinized tissue you can see the disease process, whether you want to call this perimucositis or whether it's periimplantitis. It is inflammation that is not going to resolve itself because there is no attached gingiva on either of these implants. So what we're going, what we're going to do here is we're going to go ahead and create a wide vascular bed as we did on the previous case. And here we see the vascular bed and notice again, we have not exposed bone in the apical area because if we expose bone, we cannot place the vertical stabilizing suture. And you don't need to score bone because where the graft takes in the apical area will be the depth of an increased vestibule. And so here we see the size of the graft that we're going to do. We're not attempting any root coverage on this implant, obviously, because we're not, we're not concerned with anything but a functional result. So we've made a pattern with Burlew dry foil. I'm not sure that that's still available. You see the size of the piece on the right that we're going to take from the palate, as you see we're doing here, and the size of the graft that we're going to place in that area. So here we see the same application we talked about before. Here we see the interdental positioning sutures. Here we see the apical stretching sutures. And again, a very key suture that straps the graft against the vascular surface and really does stabilize the graft. Now, one thing I have used for years, as many of you know, is calcium sulfate. And there will be a presentation on that in this web, uh, web textbook a little later. 
you can see where we uh, have very little bleeding up here and the person doing the surgery we can see on the top left place some calcium sulfate before placing some surgicel and then using a sealant over the top of that cyanoacrylate. But this area was not covered by the calcium sulfate and let's follow that and see what happens. Here we see a two-week post-op on this and certainly you begin to see some sloughing of the epithelial surface on the graft which will dramatically be pointed out in the in the next case. But you can see we're deepening the vestibule and you can see where we're where the palate is healing and where we did not use the calcium sulfate the tissue is a little immature. So I would like to thank Dr. Dusty Hedgepath for allowing me to use this case in this web textbook. Free gingival graft before implant placement. Now think about that last case. The implants were in place. We did a graft on the facial. The patient will have keratinized tissue on the facial, but what about the lingual? I know of no way to do a graft on the lingual of an implant. So therefore, there will be no keratinized tissue on the lingual, only on the facial. Here we see an edentulous arch, and the thing I think that's, uh, that is important in this case, we need to talk about age-appropriate dentistry. And again, there will be an animated video on that. This patient is between 45 and 50, and I think having keratinized tissue both on the facial and the lingual of the implant, uh, that's what I would want in my mouth. However, if the patient's 80 years old and you want to have a mucosal margin on that, that is entirely different than on this patient who's probably going to live for another 50 years. This is the caliper that I like. And you can see we've opened it up and you can measure up to a half a millimeter. And as we look across here, as we measure across the top of the ridge here, that we're going to do a graph that's about 25 millimeters uh, in length uh, or in width on that. Here we see the graft height that we're going to want. The old mucogingival junction is marked along here and we need to add that. And we've got about three millimeters of keratinized tissue and we want to extend the graft into the vestibule for about 10 millimeters. So the graft width, as we said earlier, is 25 and the size of the graft vertically is going to be uh, a little over 10 millimeters. So here is the bed preparation and notice because we have no implant in place or tooth, there's no way we can do the sutures that we did before. So basically what we're doing is we're placing individual sutures along the uh, superior aspect of this and we will place some ap apical stretching sutures. There's no way that you can do the vertical stabilizing on this and strap it against that. But do you realize that this graft is not going to be as, as stable and the epithelium is going to slough so those of you that don't like blood may want to close your eyes as we show the next slide. Here is the day the graft is done and six days later, look at the sloughing epithelium. Then we see that's one week post-op. We simply wipe away this necrotic tissue, exposing the, the proud flesh underneath and let, 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 allow that to heal for one more week and look at the tissue maturity we have down there. So what we have here, we can see the outline of the graph. We can see the old mucogingival junction to the left and right. And you can see not only have we deepened the vestibule, but now we have 20 millimeters across uh, horizontally and the shrinkage of the graph, we have nine. So what we're going to do now that this is solidly healed is we're going to make an incision to bone right here. The coronal portion of that we will apically position to the lingual and we will coronally position the lower part of that at the, at the day of implant placement. So after implant placement, this is you can see the shrinkage that takes place and typically you can get up to 60% shrinkage on this. 
So keep in mind, if you want to have three millimeters of keratinized tissue on the facial and lingual, vertically, you have to make a significant graft. Now, here we see the healing uh, about two weeks after the implants have been in place. And on the lower right, you will see the new mucogingival uh, junction on the facial. You can see the healing line. And vertically, it doesn't show well, but we have about three millimeters of keratinized tissue on the lingual as well. So note, as we say on final healing, there will be three millimeters of keratinized tissue on the facial and three millimeters of keratinized tissue on the lingual. And you look at the size of the graph that I've done here. You look at the raw healing on that. But these patients who are wearing an upper denture the denture serves as a stent to protect the area, and it's amazing how little discomfort these patients have. Now, ideally, in doing the graft, I would much prefer that the patient not wear the denture for a couple of weeks, and by using a denture adhesive and sort of pursing their lips, they can get along pretty well. However, if they wear the denture and it rubs against it and we have an unfavorable outcome, that is because of the patient not following our recommendation. So grafting before implant placements, placement gives us the ability to gain keratinized tissue on both the facial and the lingual. But if you wait till after the implant placement, the inability to gain keratinized tissue on the lingual becomes the problem. So again, I think this is age appropriate. Are you gonna have a mucosal margin on a two implant overdenture on an 80 year old, that's probably acceptable. But if you've got a 40 to 45 year old patient, a dentulous, and they're gonna have a mucosal margin, I think it's common sense that they're gonna have problems, uh, gingival problems in the future around those mucosal margins. So creeping attachment. We go back to 1980 and modern presented this with a five-year follow-up on 10 patients after a free gingival graft, and creeping attachment was the main mechanism for uh, coronal coverage. And uh, this occurs during the first year and no further increase after that point. All right, I disagree with what Matter found because on some of my graphs, which I observed, you know, 10, 15, 20 years later, there was further creeping attachment that took place beyond the first year. So that was my clinical impression on this. Now we're going to go to part three. And this is the free gingival graft plus the coronal position flap. And we're going to have a whole uh, video presentation on this web textbook on the coronal position flap, which should be used much more often than it was used in the past. Originally, I thought this was a class four recession, but the way it treated it turned out to be a class three because you would not, looking at this, anticipate any root coverage, but you will see the root coverage that we did get, which throws this into a class three. This case is about 40 years old. And what's the treatment plan here? That uh, central with the recession was condemned and the patient was referred to me before that tooth was extracted to do a gingival graft to enhance the edentulous area and thicken it where an ovate ponic could be done and a four unit bridge was going to be done after that central was extracted. That was the state of the art 40 years ago. Now remember what I said earlier. I always wanted to use three papilla to suture to because it was easier to stabilize the graft. So here it is, and you will see that I have got three uh, interdental positioning suture, two in the edentulous area and one on the mesial. And you will also notice that I have two, uh, one on the mesial, one on the distal apical stretching suture. But what suture is missing? the vertical stabilizing suture. Holbrook and Ocean Beam had not published their article yet, so it had not occurred to me to place that suture. So you can see the adaptation of this is not as good as we saw in the cases where we used the vertical stabilizing suture. But anyway, look at the size of the graph 
and you'll note that I went entirely across the avascular area, not anticipating that that would heal, but that we would get the ridge augmentation, especially in a facial dimension, once this healed. So we let this heal, and the patient comes back about six weeks later, and look what we have on the lower right. Do we have three millimeters of keratinized tissue on the facial of that central incisor? Is it a millimeter thick? Is there any root abrasion on that? So, did not know at that point the criteria for the corona position flap, but in retrospect, this meets. So what I decided to do was to not coronally position, but obliquely position this flap so I could avoid coronally positioning the frontal. So here is where the obliquely positioned flap was done, and you will notice on the mesial how I skirted the frontal. But unfortunately, the distance or the width of the papilla at this point is only a millimeter and a half, and using the suture material, uh, we did not have the fine suturing material that we had have now. There was no way that I could put a suture through that without tearing the flap on the mesial. But if the incision had been angled in a little different way, then we could have gotten the root coverage that we wanted. So I lost track of the patient, and the patient changed dentist and came back 15 years later and saw my partner. He found the old record and saw that I had done a graft on that and asked if I wanted to see the patient. So on the lower right, we see the 15-year result and the root coverage that we had. Now, why had the patient not follow through with the treatment plan? She had been told that that central incisor was a hopeless tooth. And I said, well, why didn't you follow through? She says, well, it looked pretty good to me, so I was going to wait till I lost it before I had the bridge done. But now we fast forward 40 years later, and periodontal plastic surgery has literally saved the tooth. And now this case is vastly simplified because a single tooth implant can be placed in that lateral incisor area. And by the thickening of the bone that naturally occurs over that period of time, it could probably be done with a punch, no bone grafting necessary. So periodontal plastic surgery in this case, using combined therapy, including the free gingival graft with the crony position flap, will produce the result that we want. So this is the dimple where the patient has been wearing a flipper partial for many for 15 years. And so the aesthetic result could be very much enhanced and the functional result as well by placing a single tooth implant. So what I'm asking you to do is to go to the next video on the coronal position flap where we will talk more about the classification of the papilla and the five criteria necessary to consider to see if you can rule in a coronal position flap, which is a much easier procedure to do, produces a much more aesthetic result than a free gingival graft, and a procedure that needs to be done more and more and more, especially in lieu of a class five restoration.